she will be discussing one of my favorite topics, certainly, technical debt. Please join me in welcoming her. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure speaking with you today. I love PyCon. It's my favorite time of the year. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you today about one of my favorite topics, too, which is technical debt. I've been a developer for eight years now. I've worked in five different programming languages professionally from in companies from multinational conglomerates to five-person startups. And I've seen some things. I think anyone who writes code has seen some things. So let's talk about technical debt. What is technical debt? It's a series of bad decisions that are both business and technical that lead to code that's error prone and architecture that's error prone. You end up using a lot more resources to accomplish less. How do we think about this in layman's terms? What decisions were made in the past that prevent me from getting things done today. So what causes this elusive technical debt monster? Spoiler alert, me, I cause it. And you, you all cause it too. If you've ever written a line of code, you've probably created some technical debt. I hope no one in the audience disagrees with me. So when I started off my career, I made a few mistakes early on that, that definitely made a ton of technical debt. I didn't see the value in unit tests. Uh, I think that's a big rookie mistake. Um, you know, why should I add tests? It works, doesn't it? I did what you asked me. I don't think there's anything else to it. The other thing is, I didn't know how to say no to features. So, you know, when your manager comes to you and they're like, X, Y, and Z is awesome, uh, maybe it's time to kind of calm them down and say, uh, you know, some of these features are bad ideas, bad design decisions. Let's, let's think things through before we just slam them into our code base. Some other mistakes that I made were overly optimistic estimates. So my estimates didn't include the time it would take to write tests, clean up, or refactor. And my priorities were pushing code. I didn't care if the design was good or reusable. I wanted to be seen as a good developer. Now, I've learned the error of my ways, I promise. I'm different now. The other thing that causes technical debt is a time crunch. So, you know, this project was due yesterday. We need to get it out there, get it working. I'm just going to take a shortcut and I'll clean up the mess tomorrow. Now, who, who here has said that before? Everybody? Uh, now, Another show of hands, please. Who actually goes in tomorrow and does that cleanup? It's like, it's like 5% of the people in the room. So, you know, we, we all need to be mindful of this. Um, if, you're, if you're gonna say that, you need to follow up. But the better way is don't find yourself in, the, in this position in the first place. Unneeded complexity, huge factor. So this is really important. The lines of code committed do not equal the amount of work that you've accomplished. It's so important that I'm going to say it again. The lines of code committed do not equal the amount of work accomplished. I, I've worked with a, a developer who had this philosophy recently. Um, some people think, well, 
if I've come up with this simple way of doing it, I must be missing something. Maybe I didn't prove my worth. It's just too simple. Well, simple is good. It's even good for yourself. So when you come back to this code two months later, it's going to take you less time to remember what you did in the first place. The other um, huge cause of technical debt is a lack of understanding. So sometimes my workflow has looked like this. Step one, I have a problem. Step two, let me look up how to do it on Stack Exchange. Step three, Eureka, I found it. I'm just going to copy this and paste it into my code base. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Bugs, you have bugs now. Um, so, so don't do this and put it in your code and forget about it. You're going to have a, a really bad time. Um, it's, it's a ticking time bomb with undesired consequences. So if you do find a solution, read through it. Make sure you fully understand it and its side effects before you willy-nilly paste it into your code base. Technical debt causes a culture of despair. This code base is already a heaping pile of trash. Who's going to notice if I just put this broken bottle on top and walk away? <laughs> uh, nobody, right? So maybe it was there before you got there, but don't be that person. So technical debt, red flags. How do you know if you have it? Code smells are a good indication. They're not bugs, but they're, they are an indication of a deeper problem. Some example of code smells are duplicated code, uh, long methods, large classes, contrived complexity like we talked about. All these things make the code difficult to follow. So stick with simplicity. Don't make it more complicated than you need to. A few more code smells, half-implemented features. Someone thought we needed it that one time. Actually, we didn't, but it's still in the system. So every time you go and read this piece of code, you're bogged down with information that's totally not applicable to the task that you're doing. Uh, no or poor documentation. So cowboy coders, no one else is ever going to look at this. I'm going to work here forever. No one works anywhere forever. Um, no documentation means that your code base isn't optimized for teamwork. Uh, and if you use something like Sphinx for document generation, by having doc strings, you get a lot for free. Commented out code, incorrect comments. Y you're skimming the code. You're trying to get an idea of what it does. You read the comment instead of deep diving, and all of a sudden, your idea is totally wrong. No tests or broken tests. So I think I'm going to say something a little bit controversial. Um, I think that broken tests are even worse than no tests because it's negative reinforcement. I don't want to run those tests. I'm going to get a big red X. I don't like that red X. I don't think anyone likes that red X, right? So in this scenario, not having tests at all is better. Don't associate tests with being a bad thing. Poor documentation. So bad comments. You're asking yourself, well, how bad can it really be? Here's an example I borrowed from Raymond's talk yesterday. So we have this awesome, organic, gluten-free pizza factory that we get our dough from. Um, you know, we've got this stock string. It's GMO-free and gluten-free and just all those good things. Um, well, yesterday we ran out of that stuff. So I'm just going to comment out, uh, you know, that line of code and go to my other supplier that has that GMO, you know, white, uh, white bread pesticide dough. And I'll, I'll just add that in real quick and change it tomorrow. You might end up with some uh, pretty angry customers if you go this route. Then there are architecture and design. I'm going to call these smells also. 
parts of the code base that nobody wants to touch. You couldn't pay me to work on the core. Changing code that, you know, in one part of the system that breaks functionality in a different part of the system. These kinds of things cause some severe outages that are frequent and unexpected. So in short, good design. When you implement new features, it comes easily. Bad design, you feel like you're always shoehorning new features into the system. It doesn't apply all the time, but let's call it an 80-20 rule. If 80% of the time it's easy, you're probably doing it right. Some Python-specific smells. Functionality changes, variable names don't. Because of the typing of Python, this, this is a, a huge problem. So if you have some code that looks like this and someone changed uh, the value of employees to some guy named Bob, when you call employee zero, you're gonna be expecting John, but instead you're gonna get a big capital B. And that might break things further down the line. So subtle bugs like this are really tough to catch on a read through. Monkey patching. Who's done this before? Good, uh, just a few people. So if, if you're doing it in a unit test, you're probably fine. If you're doing this to patch some sort of third party framework, you should really consider why you're doing that. Um, maybe you can rewrite some parts of you know, the framework and just have that in your own code base. It's, it's generally a really bad thing and a, and a hidden surprise for other developers. What exactly does that decorator do? Well, this one is evil and it will just change the value that your method returns to false. So decorators are extremely powerful. They can mess with anything that's being passed in or returned from a method. I will tell you that most decorators are probably not evil. But if you're using one that's outside of the standard library or it's uh, not part of the web framework that you're using, it's homegrown, home-baked, maybe that first time you use it, you should take a peek and see what it actually does and make sure that you're not gonna get any undesired side effects. Circular dependencies, I think that's a problem that we've we've all had when we first started learning Python. So if you've gotten to the point where you're doing imports inside of a method, it's a good indication that you probably have a serious design problem. So if you've gotten to this point, stop, drop, reevaluate. Before I talk about some case studies, I, I do want to make a point. Bad code and code smells are not technical debt. But they are usually an indication of a larger problem. So for those of you who live in the US, you've probably done your taxes pretty recently. Fun fact, the IRS chief says, we still have applications that were running when JFK was president. So if you had a frustrating experience, this might explain why. It's 50 year old technology. And he says, we continue to use COBOL. It's extremely difficult to find IT experts who are versed in this language. I hope that doesn't come as a surprise to anyone. So it's not just the IRS. If you think your taxes are bad, banks and financial institutions use this type of, um, use COBOL, universities, air traffic control. Some of these are kind of important and they're still stuck using COBOL because they're just in it too deep. So let me tell you a story. I used to work in finance. 
At the time I was there, all of the banking systems were running COBOL on mainframes. And the bankers were starting to get really frustrated. They wanted a UI. They wanted such modern marvels like copy and paste, undo functionality, the ability of selecting some text or searching for something with a wild card. Technology that's been around for a few decades and bankers dealing with huge sums of money did not have access to it. So some highly paid architects came up with an idea. Well, we want a really fancy new front end and it's gonna do all the things, all of them. But rewriting the back end is too expensive. We already have these mainframes. They already do what we need. Let's leave the mainframes. They came up with this idea of cursors, and, and just to clarify for you COBOL developers in the room, if there are any, these are not uh, DB2 cursors. The way these, this cursor system would work is the mainframe would output a text screen uh, from a program result based on a query, and then the results would be parsed by reading in this whole screen and saying that on line five, column 80, there is the value of amount. I hope that none of you have heard of this concept before because it is truly awful. What do you think the results were? So mainframe, still pretty fast, has some radical computing power, but this new system was incredibly slow and error prone. The bottleneck was that you had to wait for some print, uh, screen to be printed out somewhere on some terminal and copy it all somewhere and parse it and figure out what's on line five, column 80. If it was on column 81, everything was broken. So, spoiler alert, the bankers hated it. And after months of work, this multi-million dollar project was completely scrapped. So the moral of this story is you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. This is not just a problem that affects these giant corporations. I worked on a project I'm gonna call the MVP. And for those of you that don't know, this stands for minimum viable product. So get the product to early customers as soon as possible. Hack it out, make it, do whatever you need to do, and see if this idea was successful or not. It turned out to be a great idea, and it, it was successful. But the problem was the core code of this project was created by a lone developer in a coffee-fueled haze of 48 hours. There are no long-term plans, no tests, no design decisions. Because it was a great success, it stuck around. A company grew out of it, but there was a problem. Years went on, and the initial code and design did not go away. So everything in this project was based on the design decisions that were made during those 48 hours. And the push for new features was just so strong that technical debt, while growing exponentially, just kept getting swept under the rug. If no one talked about it, that meant that it wasn't there. That's not true, by the way. Scope creep came along. The, co the code, blo uh, code base ended up being incredibly complex. A lot more working parts than necessary. Features that were a good idea in those 48 hours stuck around forever, just in case we need them later. We didn't need them. And the result was some really sad developers. There were no working tests. When a release was pushed, something was bound to break almost every time, and it hurt. It made it feel like it was your fault. 
even when it wasn't. And that's not a great way to boost morale. What happened in this project? It ground to a halt. We had to battle this design every time a new feature was added. Development time for new features skyrocketed. And the project was deemed just too difficult to maintain and canceled. So the moral, the moral of the story is sometimes you need to burn it. You need to burn it with fire. There comes a point where there's no saving it. If it's rewriting one part of the system or scrapping it all, sometimes it's the only way a software system can, can be saved. It's a really tough sell to management, but if you take the time to create an estimate, evaluate some technical decisions, work on a better design, cut features, update technology, you might be surprised by how little time this will actually take versus how bogged down you are with the current system and how long it takes to implement new features. So how do we battle this technical debt monster? First, we don't point fingers. If Joe is the source of all this technical debt, you know, that Joe guy, and he quit four years ago, well, you can't really blame Joe anymore. You've adopted this project. If Joe still works with you, you, sh you still shouldn't point fingers at him. Technical debt is a team-wide problem. Everybody needs to be a part of the solution. We all own the code base. We can work together. Luckily, with Python, we have PEP8, so it's a first start to how your code should look. But we should have code standards, too. PEP8 doesn't solve everything. Maybe some people like an 80 character limit, maybe some people like 120. Figure it out, write it down, and stick with it. Other programming languages don't have anything like PEP8, so we're really lucky to have it. An elegant code base is one that's worked on by multiple people, but looks like it was worked on by one person. So pair program, when you're working on something and you're like, that's a bad idea, and you file that away and you never take care of it, it's a lot easier to deal with when someone is sitting behind you and tapping you on the shoulder and saying, hey, that's a bad idea. Let's do it. Let's take care of it right now. If you can't pair program, do code reviews. Any line of code that gets merged into master should be looked at by at least two sets of eyes. Unless something is literally on fire, that garbage can is flaming in front of you, unreviewed code does not go into master. Stay accountable. The project that I work on right now is well tested. It's a pleasure to work on. I I would consider myself a good programmer and a careful one, but the amount of bugs and typos and subtle things that are, caused by, uh, that are caught by unit and integration tests even surprises me. There's, there have been some small, potentially explosive bugs that are seen within a moment of me running this test. But unit tests won't do very much for you if you don't actually run them. A good practice is to set up a pre-commit hook for Git to run your unit tests. If they fail, you can't even check in your code. Or have continuous integration. I'm a fan of Travis. It integrates with GitHub, and it'll be green or red when you open a pull request. That's a great way to see if your tests are failing or not. Now, this all sounds awesome, but how do you sell it to management? When we allocate time to tackling debt, the end result is code that's less error prone, easier to maintain, easier to add features to. It dramatically increases productivity in the long term, and we know that. But to a manager, I think that all sounds really time consuming. Do we have any project managers in the room? A few of you should all turn around and glare at those guys. There's some better strategies, actually. Um, managers like charts, so you can show them this one. I like to call it the not broken, why fix it chart. So on the bottom, we have time. And on the left, we have cost. So the, the green line is the project with technical debt management. 
It started off noticeably faster. Um, I'm sorry, it started off noticeably slower, but as time goes on, the cost to add new features stays the same. The Red Project is one that doesn't have any, ma uh, doesn't have any way to, to deal with that technical debt. So it started off faster, everyone was hacking away and putting in new features, but as time goes on, the cost to add those features skyrockets. So show your managers this chart. Say, I have a chart. And this is how tackling our technical debt will help our team in the long term. If the chart doesn't help, managers like skiing. So you can tell them about the ski rental problem. You're going skiing for an undetermined amount of time. It costs a dollar a day to rent or $10 to buy. So engineers get to choose. What are the risks of errors with an overly complex design? versus taking the time to reduce complexity in design before making a change. So not tackling your debt is renting, buying is tackling it. So tell them about this analogy and next time they're skiing in Vail, they might think about it. There's also another cost and that's a people cost. Hiring developers is hard. You need developers more than we need you. Technical debt frustrates developers. Frustrated developers quit. So here's a pro tip. If you're about to start a new job, see if you can sign an NDA and quickly take a look at their code base. Maybe pair program with someone there before you make a decision. If you see any of the red flags that were discussed earlier, it might not be the best job for you. Know that some lingering technical debt is, a, is inev excuse me, inevitable, so you can't be a, a perfectionist about it. You need to figure out what the project tolerance is and work with it. So good decisions today might be a bad decision tomorrow, and you just, you can't fix everything. So you can use these arguments to justify it to management, but if that doesn't work, tell them that you always need to code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code is a violent psychopath. And he knows where you live. So Martin Golding said that. If your manager listens to nothing else, tell him or her that it's for your safety. <laughs> so how do we win the fight? We pay down our debt, we prioritize, um, what causes the biggest and most frequent pain points? Work on that first. What's the shelf life of the project? What's the life expectancy? A longer shelf life means it's higher interest and it's very situational. Is the project gonna be around for five years? Do you work for a bank? Take the time, pay down the debt and you'll get a huge payout for your code base. If the shelf life is five minutes, if you're working on a Yo app, maybe it's not worth taking the time to, uh, to tackle that technical debt. It might not be as important. If you don't know what the shelf life of your product is, err on the side of paying down debt. On the flip side, technical debt can be strategic. So like with money debt, if you don't have to pay it off, you've just gotten something for free. If you are building a system and you've racked up all this debt and it's gonna get decommissioned, you just won. This is not the usual case, but it is one to be aware of. So we tackle this debt with refactoring. It is absolutely the single greatest, most important tool in your toolbox. What is it? It's, it's a systematic way to change the code without changing functionality while improving design and readability. Basically, a clearer way of saying the same thing. Slow and steady wins the race in this case. The end goal is really to refactor without breaking existing functionality because if you do, 
it's negative reinforcement to both the developers and management that taking the time to refactor is not worth it. So replace functions and modules incrementally and test as you go. At this point, tests are absolutely mandatory. How you make time to do this really depends on the scope of your problem, the size of your team. There's quite a few variables, but some good strategies. If your team is small, maybe one or two people, try to devote a week to managing technical debt every six to eight weeks. If you have a medium-sized team, it might be time to devote a person per week, uh, maybe per month. Rotate them out for their sanity, please. If you're a huge company, maybe everyone devotes 10% of their time to fixing the debt problem and 90% of their time to implementing new features. Now, note that your estimates should now account for this, this additional time that you're taking, so your clients aren't perpetually angry with you. I'm gonna leave off with a few last tips. Code is for humans. It's a common misconception. Code is not for computers. We are the ones that work on the software. We are the ones that maintain it. Make sure that your variable names are human readable. Leave comments. Do all those nice things that we've talked about. And be mindful about it so that other humans can go back and read your code. There are some common best practices, like don't repeat yourself. Everyone knows dry, right? But if being dry requires some sort of mind-bending backflips or abstractions, just to not repeat five lines of code, stop. Stop what you're doing right now. It's not worth it. And this applies to all best practices. They're a generalism, but they might not be a best practice for you or for your particular situation. The last tip is uh, my favorite. It's the Boy Scout rule. So it's uh, by Uncle Bob Martin. He's uh, someone who's been around for quite a long time. Some of you might have heard of him. And Boy Scouts have this rule. Always leave the campground cleaner than you found it. Uncle Bob has a rule. Always check in a module cleaner than when you checked it out. And I absolutely adore it. It's the little things. Remove those unused imports and variables, a commented out chunk of code, blow it away. It's why we have version control. If you have that heaping pile of trash for a code base, pick up that top broken bottle and put it in the recycling. It's gonna make that code base more pleasurable to work on for both yourself and your teammates and anyone who gets to touch it in the future. Finally, expect to be really frustrated you're cleaning up days, months, years, if you work for the IRS, decades of bad code. This might feel like untangling a ball of giant yarn. It might feel impossible, but don't give up. You can do it and the results are so worthwhile. Thank you, everyone. That's it for me.
So if you'd like to ask questions, uh, you're welcome to go up and talk with the speaker in person. Thank you. I will also upload the slides on my Twitter uh, shortly. <laughs>